confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
that your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. from Samuel, or 2 Samuel, chapter 22. With the merciful, you shall show yourself merciful. With the blameless, land, blameless man, you should show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some, some of them did, and they were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
said 100 measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of God. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the gospel of the Lord.
in the holy name of Jesus. Yikes, it's a tricky one. You're going to have to pay attention today. Even though the story starts out so simply, this charge, one charge against the steward or manager, as ESV puts it, is that he has been wasteful. He has failed to take care in the conduct of his duties. You could speculate and wonder it's possible that there was some malice on his part, but there's really nothing in the text that says that. Mostly, this manager's wastefulness came from being careless, which we'll talk about more later. But what was his job? This manager, this man had one duty, which was to serve. To serve as an agent and an executor on behalf of his master. To make business deals, to collect debts, to run the numbers. All this for his master. But this manager was acting as if he had no master at all. And if he does, he doesn't seem to matter much. If he really cared about his master, and about his master's interests, then this manager would have been more responsible, more invested, and more interested in doing well. But as it is, he doesn't care. And so, naturally, he is reckless with that which does not belong to him. The story even progresses naturally here when the man finds out he is so reasonably upset, but what's remarkable, where the record skips, is how he reacts to the accusation. He would be completely justified to fire this steward on the spot, but somehow he doesn't. At a minimum, I know what good managers would do. I know what any shrewd master would do. At a minimum, he should put the manager on a long weekend. Have the guards escort him out of the building, seize the books immediately, and tell him that he might hear from personnel on Monday. But he doesn't do that. And we should expect that he would, because if you look at other parables featuring, featuring masters and irresponsible servants, they don't get treated half so mildly. But the story continues because it must, because the most important part is still coming. And it's how the man responds. The threat of being out of a job shocks the steward such that it brings him to his senses. His eyes are wide, his blood pressure is elevated, and he is running through all the possible scenarios because he knows the jig is up. Now is the press, and now is the time to figure something out. After all, he does have a standard of living, and he needs to maintain that. He's smart enough to know that he can't do real work, and he's prideful enough to know that he can't handle the shame of begging. So he, were, he will either rise to the occasion, or he will perish. And this is where we find out something about him. We find out that the manager was never incompetent. He was never lacking in talent or skill. What this manager lacked was motivation. He didn't care all that much for his master, and so he had no real reason to try. But now his very life depends on him figuring things out. And the manager does not disappoint. You get the insight into his mind when he says, I have decided what to do. So that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their homes. Now, we see what the guy is really capable of. All of a sudden, this wasteful, lazy, unimaginative manager does a total 180. Now that it matters to him, the manager becomes creative, industrious, clever, aggressive, and shrewd. He calls everybody in and gives the first guy a 50% discount, and the next guy a 20. All of a sudden, this manager is a hero. He's like Robin Hood. What a guy. And so when that mean, rich capitalist pig puts him out on the street, 
those debtors will remember that he was on their side. And looking on, the rich man sees this suddenly shrewd, clever, dishonest manager. He sees what he does, and he commends him for it. He looks over at his secretary and says, Would you look at that? I guess he's not half as dim as you thought. In fact, with the right motivation, there's no telling what he might be capable of. By now, I think you see it all, too. You can see how he poured what he pursued and how he poured himself into something that was important to him. He got on this like it was the only thing that mattered because he was serving his master well. Of course, his master, his God was his belly, his comfort and his temporal well-being. All of that you can tell by how relentlessly he pursued it. This is the part that is the example that Jesus says Christians should be imitating. It's what he means when he says the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. He's chastising you to be more like this dishonest manager, more aggressive, more industrious, more thoughtful, more concerned with the things that ultimately matter than he is with things that don't. So consider your positions your responsibilities, your resources. You have been given so much to work with, especially this room. Your reason, your talents, your bodies, your money, etc. All these things are put into your care, which makes you managers too. So the question is asked, how are you using them? Where do you go the extra mile to be shrewd and clever and enterprising and aggressive? What is it that you pursue? What occupies your thoughts, your time, and your energy? Is it the value of your home, the content of your accounts, the clothes you're wearing, the car you're driving, or whether you get to shop at Whole Foods or Aldi? What matters to you really? And how do you know? You could tell. You could tell what mattered to the manager by how he used his talents and his energies. And it wasn't his master. And now that you've taken stock of these things, turn your attention to another, even bigger feature of the story. For all this talk of shrewdness, notice that the master isn't the least but shrewd. He does not seem even mildly concerned with any of these things. He doesn't act shrewdly at all when he sees the manager's wastefulness. If this rich man was really worried about all the money being wasted, he would have responded so differently, but he doesn't. And that's because the master in the parable is a stand-in for God himself. Everything that exists already belongs to him. He himself doesn't need more money. What he wants is a faithful steward. And what he wants is to see debts be forgiven. And this is where you Christians come in again. It's already clear that Jesus intends for you to identify with the steward. That much is clear. But you should also see yourself in the place of those whose debts are being forgiven. Because you also have spiritual debts and are in need of mercy. So much... So very much is wrong in this story. But the one who tells the story, the one who gives us this parable and teaches from it, is also the one who makes everything right. Jesus has been a faithful steward. Jesus has been faithful with his father's things where you have not been. He has been faithful with righteous and unrighteous wealth alike. And chiefly, he has been faithful with these things by giving them away. He doesn't bother writing off 50% or writing 20%. Jesus forgives you your debts, which we in the Lord's Prayer render as trespasses. But he does not merely make you swear or even or 
put you back to square one. He gives you a credit. Jesus actually bestows on you more than you had before. This is righteous wealth because it, it is the inexhaustible treasure of Jesus' own righteousness. That beauty, that perfection, that perfect keeping of the law, that perfect obedience, everything won for you on the cross and given to you freely from font, pulpit, and altar. And because you have this treasure, because you are baptized, because you, though you are those who receive God's word and sacrament, because you have this, this truly righteous wealth, then you can look at the unrighteous wealth with the same cavalier spirit that the master in the parable does, as something which is fleeting and ultimately without meaning. So go ahead and use the unrighteous wealth well. Take care of people. Be generous. Spend and be spent. The stuff that you're giving away doesn't really matter anyways. Your salvation is already secure. You know because of Christ's sure promise, you will not be put out of your master's court, and you will not be removed from his service. So you don't have to worry about folks welcoming you you into their homes in this world at all. But by living in mercy, by living faithfully with the things that God has given you in this world, the people you care for here may very well welcome you home there. That is, in the mansions Jesus has prepared for them. These debtors who learned about the truly righteous wealth because of how you used your unrighteous wealth in love for them and to the glory of God. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Amen.
Merciful Father, you show mercy to us poor sinners. Lead us to acknowledge your mercy with gratitude, that in turn we may be quick to show mercy to others. Give us a right understanding of our own weakness and frailty. Preserve us from pride, and lead us instead to cling to Christ and his forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, bless this congregation, that we would not fall prey to grumbling, adultery, idolatry, disbelief, and other great shame and vice. Support your servants called to preach throughout the world, especially the pastors of our sister synods. Do not let them be lured away into false doctrine or lead anyone astray, but preserve them in the word of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, give us a right fear of you, O Lord, that we would not abandon your truth. Give us a right love of you, O Lord, that we would fervently show mercy and thereby cover a multitude of sins. Give us a right trust of you, O Lord, that in repentance we would return to our baptism daily and in faith receive Christ's body and blood in the supper. Lord, in your mercy, uphold our nation and give us good government. Let those with authority not only be shrewd in their dealings, but also act in love, righteousness, and devotion to the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for the sick and the suffering especially the family and friends of Ryan, the family and friends of Edith, and for Courtney, Rosie, Timothy, Gerd, Ingo, Ron, and Rita, for Norma, Vettina, Marilyn, Michael, Laureen, Peter, and Mary, for Betty, Lily, Pauline, Diane, and Karen, and for our homebound, Anna, Bob, and Bayeni. Give them strength to endure their trials until you remove them. Lord, in your mercy. Give us true repentance and faith to those who commune this day that they may eat Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of their sins and in the unity of a true confession. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it. Remember it's me.
Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen.